live. I'll, I'll just, yeah, we're live. Okay, cool. So let me, let me, I'll, I'll count this in and they could edit the front end of this out. So, hi everybody and welcome. Um, this is Sean Copley, master instructor with Aerofit. Thrilled to be on our YouTube channel here with Victor Thorup. Uh, Victor, welcome. Um, you're in our office. I'm so thrilled to remotely being able to chat with you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time out to be with us. No, it's a pleasure. I'm, uh, I'm glad I'm invited. And uh, yeah, the office isn't far. I'm Danish and Aerofit is based in Denmark, so uh, <laughs> no worries for that. <laughs> right on. So I'm just a few thousand miles away, but it's cool that we could be chatting with each other, right? <laughs> so, um, so listen, um, I want to be very transparent for our audience. Um, you and I have been talking to each other for a little bit of time now, but since we're going global now and we're introducing the concept of Aerofit and introducing you as our ambassador to a bigger audience here, I was hoping that maybe you in your own words, and then maybe I'll fill in so you're not so humble, some of the achievements that you've done, but maybe you can share some of your background for everybody that's watching and let everybody know who you are, and what sport you compete in, and uh, you know a little bit about what you're working on these days. Yeah, sure can. Um, I actually started as an inline skater, but today I'm a professional ice skating or ice skating um, or <laughs> ice speed skater, and um, I managed to qualify for the previous Winter Olympics and ranked fifth there, which uh, is probably my best result so far. I had a few top ten rankings at the World Championships and. Uh, fourth place in the World Cup final um, and currently I work towards the Beijing Olympics that are if things go well COVID wise are uh, yes. gonna kick off <laughs> in half a year in Beijing so uh, yeah yeah it's very soon that's my main goal right now yeah and uh, I do besides skating I do a bunch of different sports but the like the one thing they all have in common is that I I kind of incorporate that as part of my preparations to become a better ice skater. Yeah, which I think is fantastic. So for the rest of the people listening, I'm going to fill in a few things. You correct me if I'm wrong, Victor, because you're a humble guy. So you you were in, you were at the 2008, you were in Pyeongchang. Um, I believe you got fifth place in the mass start, and that was the first time the mass start happened, right, in Pyeongchang. Um, so that that's an incredible uh, race, uh, you know, if people don't or aren't familiar with speed skating, watching the mass start race is something that I'm fascinated with. I think it's such a adrenaline rush of, of a race. I was wondering if you could maybe just spend a few moments, if you don't mind, for the people who don't know a lot about speed skating, share with them what what is the mass start race? Why is it so special? What's what what makes it complicated and dangerous and how do you have to control yourself in a race like that, right? It's a, it's an amazing thing when you watch it on TV uh, from afar. I've never experienced it up front myself, so I can only imagine what it's like. It's fun uh, and it's fast. No, it's uh, it goes for all long track skating that we compete on a 400 meter track. So it's mm -hmm. simple way to explain it is that it's the same as track and field, except the track is frozen. It's frozen water, <laughs> and then we right. just skate around in circles and generally fast skater wins and most of the distances are time trialing so we just compete against each ourselves basically and the clock sure and faster time wins and uh, then there's this discipline that entered the olympics in 2018 called the mass start where instead of just skating solo we all compete at the same time there are semi-finals but we still we're allowed to be up to 24 skaters on the rink at the same time and this is interesting uh, for a bunch of reasons. It's very unpredictable and it's very tactical. And then no race plays out the, the way the previous race did. So in, sometimes it ends up being a bunch sprint where I have no chance of being competitive. Sometimes it's a ridiculously hard race where we just go at it right from the gun where Right. I, thanks to decent fitness, managed to be uh, one of the best skaters <laughs> there is at the end of such a race. And um, there's some yeah. intermediate sprints during the race, and you're not going to win a mass start by winning the intermediate sprints, but they do mix things up a bit, and they're, especially for my case, I try to go in a breakaway that can make it all the way to finish. It's, it's a very good... Uh, chance to get in like to do a counter attack after one of those sprints and 
Also, right. it makes it a lot more interesting than just watching skaters wait for a final sprint that we have these in the middle. So it's unlike all other skating disciplines, it's kind of interval like uh, racing. Yeah, I, I love it because you you know you and I have spoke before. I have a I have a cycling background, so I I think in terms of cycling all the time. So it's the most relatable speed skating race I could see in my mind that's similar to cycling because of those intermittent and interval sprints that happen during the race. And it's highly tactical, right? And you know me, Victor, I'm always going to spin this into the idea that in a tactical race with where you're making instant decisions throughout the entire race at high levels of awareness, right? You're going to get into nervous system control, um, how, when do you apply adrenaline at the right times? Those types of concepts, right? And I'm going to ask you about that in a minute, but I still have to finish bragging about you a little bit because you didn't say a few other things, right? So I believe you are still the Danish national record holder for the, or is it the 1,500, 3,000, 5,000, and 10,000 meters? Um, am I right? True. Um, um, yep. Fa fantastic, right? So, so all all considered i guess they would be considered distance you know lengths but the 1500 is a relatively i consider that a very long sprint in a lot of ways i don't know if i'm right or not so can you walk us through quickly before we get into some breathing stuff in a few moments can you walk us through how do you compete in and win or do national records across such a length a, a broad width of races and is the training different for each of those races how do you approach getting a national record in all of those it, it sounds pretty remarkable. Uh, I mean, it, to some extent it is. You got to remember that skating is also a very technical sport. Um, so for me, if you look at my physiology and everything, like how I train, how I prepare for racing, I do really focus on the mass start, the 5K and the 10K, so what we consider long distance. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the fact that I managed to do okay in middle distance is just because I developed a an efficient technique. Uh, and especially if you, now we're talking national records, but if we look at it at an international level, I am still quite far from being amongst the best skaters in the world in the middle distance field, like the 1500 meter, where 5K and, and the mass start is where I have a shot at, at meddling at the Olympics. So I do prioritize that uh, compared to the, the middle distance. Okay, cool. But you still managed to get the national record, which is high. I mean, that's to me, that's incredible. So congrats uh, on what I know is a lot of hard work. And so, um, I, again, don't mind if I'm bragging on your behalf, Victor, a little bit throughout this throughout this talk. Um, so I, I'd like to say this to the people who are watching, um, Victor. I consider you a Renaissance athlete, and what I what I typically mean by that is, I you're you're someone who I've gotten to know a little bit, and you appreciate the art and the science of what you do. Um, and I think you see your your sport as a holistic thing where you're trying to better yourself from every angle in, in your participation and your preparation for your sport. So you you and I got to know each other through this medium of breath work, um, but, but you had been open-minded to some of these concepts before we met. Um, so as maybe you could enlighten us in the audience here a little bit about, you know, when did you find out about you know, maybe the world of yoga, the world of breathing and so forth before you met Arafit, because you were aware of these topics before we met. So I was wondering if you can give a little background there. Well, I've always been very uh, data driven and a big fan of like trying to chase those marginal gains. I think I've been very competitive and, and from an early age, I already trained a lot and came to realize that it's not always the person that trains the most that will end up winning because uh, they're at some point, especially as a professional athlete, you reach a limit for how much you can do. It's not like the reason I train five hours a day is not because I don't have time for it or because I don't want to. It's just that's what your body is capable of doing. So that made me realize that I had to look elsewhere for those extra gains. And when it's especially in a sport, a sport like speed skating, where it literally comes down to hundreds of a second then there's so many different ways where you can look back and like, uh, what if I had improved that by just a little bit? Um, sure. And I think I became aware of that at an early age. I, uh, I, I started thinking more about sleep, started thinking more about nutrition. Uh, this was even the, the 
the reason I decided to get a degree in, in health and nutrition. Um, right. And this is also what brought me to, to Aerofit. I started, I actually started using a device called Spear Magic, where um, it wasn't a training device like Aerofit, but it it helped me. It, it's a monitoring device, so you could test your lung capacity and test. Sure. Um, just monitor yourself in that way. And that was when I became aware that training and a lot of other things actually correlates a lot with how your lungs are doing. And back then I used the, let's say the other way around. So I saw when, when I had heart workouts, how did that affect my, my breathing? How did that affect my lung performance? Um, more like I would track my workouts with a heart rate monitor. Um, but sure. up until well, that'd be five, six months ago, I never looked at it the other way around that I should probably train my lungs specifically individually and, and kind of work it that way around. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I think because you bring that up, I'm going to extrapolate on that a little bit more, if you don't mind, because, you, you know, I, I talk to all kinds of athletes, not just speed skaters around the world. And the one invariable truth I find, and I think you're ahead of the curve, Victor, to be fair, um, just because you're conscious and aware and looking for these marginal gains. Um, I work with some of the best athletes and talk to some of the best athletes in the world, and they're very familiar with things like VO2 max and, you know, high intensity workouts and you know they even might know something about hrv but most of them don't know a lot about the physiological science of respiration and most of them have never spent time isolating the respiratory musculature the diaphragm and the intercostals and nobody really sits around thinking of those as separate muscles they need to train they assume because they do aerobic workouts that that's kind of taken care of so I was wondering maybe if you could start the conversation about, you know, how Aerofit started helping you with your training, what your revelations were, if you will, that you had, that all of a sudden you realized, wait a second, this secondary set of muscles that everybody takes for granted actually is kind of important and actually starts to help me with my performance. So if you could share a little bit about how you just, what your journey was when you first started using this thing, and maybe you're surprised at how you started to make progress. Yeah, definitely. Um... I, th I think, first of all, the reason a lot of people oversee this is because you don't feel it naturally. I mean, when I'm when I'm skating a race, uh, when I cross the finish line, it's not like, oh, I think I think I could have used my lungs better. It's more like my legs are burning. It, it's not where you feel <laughs> the immediate pain. So you wouldn't necessarily right. make the link between, oh, I should probably do this. I should probably do that. Um, so it doesn't come as a natural thing to look into that. And uh, I think for me, this it's been my luck coming from a really tiny skating nation um, where there was, there was nobody to tell me, oh, you need to do this kind of workout, that kind of workout, you should do this to improve your performance. I was, uh, I was kind of forced to explore things a bit. And, That's cool. And look outside the, uh, the norms. And, um, and that's, like one of the reasons I, I started using the Aerofit and then obviously what, what made me continue with the Aerofit is the progress I felt. Um, and now I started, I usually started using it in the beginning of March, right? This year, 2021. And, um, and then I generally like to look at the objective data and improvements that I got, cause there's so much. There's also placebo involved in this. Like if I just say, yeah, I feel a lot better because uh, my lungs are so much stronger, I can continue forever. So I try and always just look at the, the stats, the facts that I can actually um, measure. So it doesn't mean that feeling better won't make you a better athlete, but it's so much easier right. <laughs> to just think of those things. Because I have also tried a lot of wearables, a lot of other like attempts to win some of those uh marginal like the marginal gains in different fields where i also came to realize uh this doesn't work maybe it works for some people for some sports just not for me um but the aerofit i i've been able to tell right away that it improved my sleep um this was partly just subjective that i felt better it took me less time to to fall asleep if you ask my fiance i stopped snoring uh, so hey, all right. She she also did benefit <laughs> from the Aerofit. 
Um, <laughs> That's great. But no, I monitor my my resting heart rate and uh, and I also track uh, generally everything with a Whoop device twenty four seven. Um, and I improved the the overall time I spent in REM or deep sleep by eight uh, percent. If you wow, compare that's that's the, significant. Yeah, and that's if you compare the average of the four months prior to to using the Aerofit and compare those to the four months after starting using the Aerofit. And uh, gotcha, that's a whole lot. Eight percent. We're talking about. Yeah, that's dramatic. A few seconds will take you from a tenth place at the Olympics to a medal. Uh, yeah. It's like if you can improve your sleep by eight percent, it's it's sure worth it. Yeah. And then, so so let me ask the important. If you don't mind me interjecting for a moment, let me ask the all important question, um, because I get this from a lot of people when I'm tested. Meaning, does Aerofit really work, or do, what are the benefits of Aerofit? Um, during that time frame when you shifted four months ago, you know that four month period where you prior to using Aerofit, did you introduce any other new training components during that time that could have skewed the correlation at all? Or was Aerofit the only thing you added in so it was isolated? And we won't call it scientifically, it's not a scientific study, but we're gonna say as close as we can to science that that's the only thing you added and that shift occurred. Is that is that what it happened? Was, yeah. or we can, we can gonna... isolate okay. that as the only thing. Because okay. I also like, <laughs> okay. I like to do that because if you change 10 different things at the same time, you can't, how, it's just going to be guesswork which one was the one that actually makes the difference. So okay. I do also try and uh, I think, isolate. Yeah, thank you for confirming that because everybody would yeah, ask yeah. me that afterwards. Oh, he must have been doing five other things too. So that's, that's it's, but it's really important. Yeah. Yeah, that's the good thing about ice skating that our season is so short. We only compete for four, four and a half months of the year. So we have the, the remainder of the year to to play around with things, like to try new things out and, and really go in depth with what works for you. And I sure. mean, this was just an example of how I, I could benefit from the Aerofit, but obviously the, the fun part came a few months later when I really started noticing during, during training. I mean, that's in the end, that's why I do all yeah. of it to become a, a better athlete and a better skater. No, that's incredible. And, and thanks for sharing that. I think it's really important for people to study correlations where they can. And if they have the time frame to isolate things, to understand them subjectively, uh, it, it's, excuse me, objectively, it's really important. Um, I, I think, I, you know, what I was hoping to ask you as well, um, when it's going down that path, right, you and I, when we first met, I think we had a more open discussion about breathing in general, right? And Aerofit was this new device that you were going to be trying out. But um, you afforded me the time, thank you, by the way, you afforded me the time when we first met to speak for a quite a significant length of time, talking about the nervous system, talking about what the muscles do, how, how muscles affect your breathing. A lot of people out there don't recognize the diaphragm or what direction it even goes in when they breathe. So there's this whole world of what I call directional breathing and conscious breathing. People have heard the term conscious breathing before. But I like to use the word directional breathing because we're talking about muscles when it comes to Aerofit. So communicating and connecting new neural pathways to connect with your musculature, right? And it's to me, it's the art of creating communication between the mind and the muscle. There's this process that happens when you start to use Aerofit that you have to start to think more about how you're breathing. So, so you, you have a background where you were curious about this. I, I don't know if you recall our conversation that we had, but we had an interesting conversation. I still remember it vividly because uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, it, can you talk about your experience as when you started to use the Aerofit, how, how you might have become a little bit differently aware of how the muscles operate? Because the Aerofit, I don't, I, I work with Aerofit and I'm a master instructor for Aerofit, and, but I don't claim that Aerofit's a panacea. I don't think it's the cure-all for breathing. It's a big part of helping people. Right, but there's other components to making breath work in synchronous ways to help you as an athlete. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit, Victor, because I think it's important. Yeah, I think especially if we we take it back to that first conversation we had that lasted for quite a bit. Um, the big eye opener for me in that was that I was already convinced and I already saw the results that the Aerofit made my lungs stronger um, mm -hmm. because I can simply I can breathe in more air faster. Um, but our conversation also made me realize that it's kind of like it's a, it's a whole 50% of it is also being able to use your lungs more. 
So one thing is having strong lungs. The other thing having is having functional lungs. And I think that you may realize we did some of this. Um, I'm not sure about the term, but directional breathing. Mm -hmm. All right. That's what I call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I like that. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I think especially in disciplines or sports where you're in uh, a breathing wise uncomfortable position, such as skating, where um, I mean, if you look at the like, performance, the technique, the, uh, the aerodynamics, you force yourself in a terrible position when it comes to yeah. using your lungs optimally. <laughs> um, and that that's when you made me realize that if you're closing down this area, because in skating you're very compact, you're very crunched over the entire time, because that's how you skate well, um, that not just having strong lungs to pull the air down, but really managing to use those lungs to, or use the lungs, expand the lungs in the right areas. Uh, and I really think for me, that was, that was half of it. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I'm so glad that we had that moment together because, and I, I, I think it's important for not just high level athletes, but for everybody in general. And that's one of the things I want to take a moment to say to everybody who's listening to this or watching this, um, to me as a breath coach, it's, it really comes down to efficiency and access to space and not adding additional stress and not burning extra oxygen by forcing the wrong muscles to work when you have access or efficiencies in other areas. So when Victor and I had this conversation, it was more about let's think about where you have accessible space in your lungs and let's activate the muscle group in the intracoastals, whether it's a laterally or even on the backside of your body, let's take advantage of those spaces that are available, not closed off. Because like every other muscle group, if you stress a muscle that's already under a maximum amount of duress or it's compacted and it can't stretch and move you're going to burn more oxygen and the nervous system is going to eventually react and push things like adrenaline out into the blood and raise your heart rate and do all those things that you might not want to have happen at the wrong time in a race because you want to maintain your reserve energy for the right time and i'm i'm planning this as a segue victor so i'm going somewhere with this so because i want to go to the point where I think you've um, seen a phenomenon happen while you're using your AirFit during your training where you've started to notice that you have a heart rate decrease. And I've talked about this with one of your buddies, Joey Mantia, because I talked to him quite often. Um, he experienced the same thing where he's operating sometimes at higher training zones with heart rates that are in a lower training zone historically against previous data. So I'm hoping that maybe based on this efficiency talk and the use of AeroFit that somehow in the mix of all this, you've realized that your heart rate has decreased during your training and during your, you know, your racing, because that's a really incredible statement to say that that happens for an athlete, because that's, that's a tangible benefit right at the end of the day. So when did this shift happen? When did you start to notice this? And, and have you noticed it continue? Is this now built in because you're using AeroFit on an ongoing basis that you're have lowered your heart rate over time during work. Um, so that started quite early in the whole process of using GearFit, but only at easy workouts or in the lower heart rate zones. And I think that was okay. mainly due to just being conscious about my breathing. So if I was going for a five hour bike ride, I would go at a certain wattage. And usually this is nice because I've been doing a ton of testing since the age of 15, every, like every three months I've been tested on a bike. So I know my different wattage zones compared to the heart rate and, and so on. Um, and in the beginning, it was just when I did my long bike rides, I had uh, the same wattage as usual, but my heart rate uh, was significantly, I think it was in average for those four months or three months in between the test, it dropped uh, about four or five beats per, uh, per minute, which is, yeah. is a lot. Um, and I think in the beginning, the early phase is really just because when I was biking, I was, I was breathing calmly. I was aware of how I was breathing and, and that just relieved some stress and I spent less energy because it was not, it wasn't something I had to fight for anymore. It's, it, it was just functioning. Um, I understood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally get it. But now lately it's, um, like, I think the best example uh, is that when I did my, I haven't told you this yet, because uh, I did about two, 
even less a week a week and a half ago my uh my 370 wattage or watts on the bike which is about my threshold now um at 370 watts my heart rate is eight beats lower than last year which is wow that's incredible that's incredible and then i was like maybe that's due to uh just i don't know g generally that i i got fitter then you have a habit of lowering your entire like heart rate but my maximum heart sure. rate is hasn't changed over the course of the last three years so it is really wow, just that's really that, interesting that that is incredible and this was the first time that i got clear feedback that it's not just because when i'm like comfortable at a chill pace i can save some energy because i'm like kind of doing yoga as i'm biking um this was right. the first time where when you're at 370 watts you're not you're not chilling anymore and you're not just like uh breathing uh calmly uh so this was super cool to be aware of and then i also had the chance the the last month uh as i returned in or back to skating actual skating on ice to feel the the difference and on ice you i mean it's the same lap no matter where you go so you can clog it and you always know if you're improving or not and that was the first time that i really felt improving on the ice wow so that that's an incredible so the, the, when you're on the bike doing those watt tests and i'm familiar with that environment very well are are these vo2 max tests like what are you just testing your wattage like what what other are there other things you're working on when you're doing that every three months just curious uh, i mean i think the main reason or the main reason we do them is just to know or for me to know which zones i have to work in so i know if i'm working on my threshold it has to be here if i'm working on my anaerobic capacities if i'm recovery if it's a recovery work i know how hard to push it um but we always go off with the same protocol it's like a classic step test where we go three minutes then increase wattage by 30 watts three minutes and so on sure and then um, we measure of course the um like the the breathing um and and then we also do lactate for each step and and then heart rate and wattage so we know when it goes yeah. from threshold to to threshold yeah. Have you noticed, I mean, look, there's a, in the academic world of lactate thresholds and VO2 maxes, there's, there's old academic information out there, you know, that says there aren't correlations between inspiratory muscular training in those areas. But I, those studies were very old and they were more health oriented than athletic oriented. Um, so I'm willing to be open minded about the idea that some of these things correlate to each other. Have you noticed any shifts in your lactate thresholds or your anaerobic threshold switches after Aerofit or in general based on since you started using Aerofit? I, I, we haven't talked about that before. I mean, obviously, I, I noticed that my my threshold has uh, improved. Um, like same way, like my what used to be my threshold is is now not my threshold anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I haven't trained so much above threshold because uh, we're not that late in the season yet, but I did have a few interval sessions on ice where I really, um, it was just easier for me. And yeah. I still haven't pushed it to the max on the ice yet. We haven't had any competitions, so I'm still um, excited to see how that actually plays out when skating for, uh, for our racing. Um, but I had... I've just been able to put in more work because, um, let's say, the best example was the hardest training I had at my last training camp was a uh, two laps, so that would be about one minute, and then a mm -hmm. one minute off, so basically a one minute, one minute session, and where usually I'd be able to do 15 repetitions of these. Uh, okay. Now I think we even took it up to 24, 28 at the... Uh, Wow. And I didn't feel like it was easier when skating, but just I, whether it was because I was able to breathe better during the both skating part and the resting period, or if it's because it took less energy for me to breathe during the rest. Um, I can't tell, but that's, I think that's for me the most, the biggest difference. That, um, yeah, that it's, it's really cool. And I, you know, it's funny. I mean, I love in the beginning, you mentioned, you know, that you love objectivity and you love data, but you're, but it's, it's kind of hard to stay away from what I call the art side of breathing, because there is that subjective nature of how you feel. And 
I look as an ex-competitive athlete, nowhere near your level, but as an ex-competitive athlete as well, psychosomatically, if I feel good about myself, if I feel confident about myself, there's an elevation there. Of course, I can't put a number to it, right? You can't put a number to confidence. You can't put a number to the generic well-being feeling that you have when you approach the start of a race. But arguably, there is a benefit to that. And I, I get from a lot of the guys from the Tour de France that I was working with, they're like, I don't know what to say, Sean. I just, I feel like a weight's been lifted off my chest. Like that, that's how they articulate it. You know, and it's like, I'm like, that's good enough for me if they just want a stage. Uh, you know, I'll take I'll take yeah, that. Yeah. It's a good thing. I was uh, you know, say that, so that's how I feel about it. like I don't. Uh, when you breathe well, you don't care about it. I mean, right. <laughs> I, I, we put this as like Aerofit is so great, and you feel great without it or with it, and and your breathing becomes better, your lungs get stronger. But like, the whole goal is to not have to worry about it. Like if if right. your lungs is not even a topic <laughs> anymore, it's perfect. It's just, it's perfect. <laughs> it happens in the background. It doesn't steal too much energy from the rest. And yeah, and that's, yeah. And I think, yeah, you're right. It's definitely a lot of it is just, uh, training it like being, being, make, make breathing your weapon and not uh, your enemy when skating. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I won't go into the weeds right now with, with the audience who's watching, but you and I could share this in front of everybody. I think. You know, I, I believe there's a true symbiotic relationship, a two-way street between your nervous system, mind, and your breathing, and they both feed each other in both directions. So your your mind and your awareness, your your audible awareness, your your visual awareness, your your body is constantly paying attention to the sound of your breath, the rate of your breath, the depth of your breath. Your nervous system is observing that, you know, and and it's sending mutual signals back and forth. And if the breath starts to sound strained the body reacts to that any any time there's a manipulation of those combination of systems um, the nervous system reacts and it has the ability to potentially put you what i'll call in like you know minor panics where maybe i should be defending myself and putting adrenaline out into the blood to engage in the fight or flight responses and so as a long distance athlete i think this is where i i think i have the most fun with my job because long distance endurance athletes who have to go, it's a constant battle as to when to turn those turbo engines on, if you will, during a race. And are you reserving enough the, the adrenaline boost for the end of the race and not complicating your race by analyzing during the race and turning the engines on too early? So that it's this wonderful symbiotic affair, if you will, between the breath and the mind and the body. And so, I'm not sure if you can articulate it, but I mean, are you and I in agreement that there's that type of relationship there and, you know, you gain better control of your nervous system and your, I guess, your analytical responses. So you stay a little bit more rational and stick to plan during race. Because in an endurance race, your plan is really important, right? Knowing the times of every lap and not overreacting if you're behind a little bit. So, you know, can you, can you walk everybody through who's not an Olympic athlete, what it's like to manage that? Uh, you know, during a race, especially. Yeah, really. I, I think it's easy, uh, easily comparable to how we think of skating itself. Like, I mean, when you go out for, say, a five kilometer race or cycling or running or whatever you do, at, at first, anything you, you can do for five kilometers is going to be pretty fun in the beginning. It's going to be pretty chill. Right. And you also told me this at our first or second conversation that, um, like we got to learn to be okay with being uncomfortable breathing wise. Cause what we do as skaters or cyclists or runners or whatever we do, we do something until it hurts a lot. And then we try and keep doing it the same way, no matter how much it hurts. <laughs> and, right. um, there's just, there's a limit to how far you can go when it becomes really uncomfortable. And at some point it's so uncomfortable that you can't push it anymore. And, uh, but we still try and chase that where the lungs, it's kind of the same thing. Like we spoke about that, that you just got to learn, teach yourself to be comfortable with it for as long as you can. And if you already become uncomfortable with your breathing, if you already lose, like you said, kind of concentration, um, early on in a race or in a competition or even in a training session, that's going to steal the energy from what you could use doing your sport. Um, 
Yeah. So I think of it a lot like like your sport. Like yeah. stay calm, stay calm, ignore that it hurts and just try and keep it up. And by training how we think of the breathing, how you taught me, how the AeroFit is every day uh, kind of teaching me how to breathe, that just um, it increases my comfortable breathing threshold. Holy right. God. Yeah. It, it, it's great. I'm glad, I'm glad you're articulating it that way because, you know, one of the things that you and I spoke about just so, so everybody who's listening can benefit, you know, I, I have a background in free diving and breath holding, right? And that's an interesting sport, uh, you know, to talk about in a whole different conversation. But it, I, I utilize information from that sport because it's a very demanding, you know, arguably the hardest breathing sport in the world because you're asked to hold your breath for very long periods of time. And the disruption in the gas exchange occurs in a way where elevated carbon dioxide in your body produces sympathetic reactions in your nervous system. So one of the things I, I think we talked about was, you know, becoming comfortable with holding your breath and why does your body and your mind and your nervous system react in a certain way? And at the fundamental primal level, your body is a, your mind is a defense tool to keep you from dying. Right? So when it senses certain things, it doesn't know any better than to act as the hunter-gatherer mind that it used to be and say, wait, I'm going to panic because I'm going to keep this person alive. So I'm going to elevate the you know, sympathetic response. And as an endurance athlete or even just a human being, we're arguably all overstimulated a lot these days. And we're in a sympathetic response more than we know. So to take your breath and understand to be comfortable with that breathless feeling, that panicky urge, which we all share. If, I, if it, we all held our breath together, eventually we'd all stammer around and want to explode and breathe again, right? We all experience that. There are ways to become comfortable with that and train that mechanism and bioadapt your body to not overreact. And I think overreaction is an area where a lot of athletes lose races because they lose their rational thought process, they become irrational, they panic, and they do what they didn't plan for, right? So when I think of you, like in the mass start race, that's where I think of it most because it's highly tactical, highly aware, but you have to be comfortable in the middle of what is a highly stressful tactical ball of energy Amongst rolling around the ice. 23 other people right? with knives in their <laughs> right? yeah, you gotta like, be, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And somehow you have to be relaxed and comfortable in that, but already, but available to burst at any given moment at, at high speed. I think there's no more demanding area in the world than that type of environment. And I, and I would love to study it more scientifically. I'd love to wire you up one day and send you in mass races and see what happens. I think it'd be fun. Um, but um, no, I, Victor, thank you for thank you for sharing that and, and letting the audience kind of know that you've I experienced that because for... we get a lot of pushback on that stuff, you know? Yeah, I think for all the people that have an AeroFit device out there, um, just to really uh, like visualize what we're talking about here is if you know any of the sessions called depth, flexibility, uh, <laughs> that's, that's for me where I could really relate to this feeling that when you become uncomfortable and then at some point you just become comfortable with being uncomfortable breathing wise. Uh, so it doesn't mm -hmm. steal your attention. It doesn't steal energy. But the first time I did uh, both of these sessions, or the first times it took a while, I would get really sweaty. I would get really warm. I would even get <laughs> yep, I remember like, dizzy. <laughs> and you could talk to me. I wouldn't know any of what you said afterwards. Whereas now, <laughs> I, I still got to concentrate. But this just shows how much breathing takes away from other things. If you try and I mean, I still can't. If I watch TV while doing the flexibility workout, I've it's like <laughs> going in, going out. It's, there's no, I can't recall anything from it. So I also still have a lot yeah. to learn um, for this to be entirely autonomous when I'm out skating. But this is is a really like those sessions are good to train that, but it's also good to make anybody realize that wow, there's there's a lot to gain here. There's and there's a lot of room to grow. Yeah, and and, and it, it does take a specific type of mindset to want to push yourself into those areas, right? Not not everybody walking down the street is going to want to experience that. I, I don't like to call it pain, right? But it's it's a it's a heightened awareness of struggle, right? In my world, right, where you're you're willing to kind of push through some of those struggles to find greener pastures, right? In a lot of ways, and and I think as an athlete, if we step if we put performance aside for a moment and we just talk about 
some of these other ideas that you and I should talk about today, you know, recovery, resilience, um, uh, ability to sleep better. This is, this is, you know, AeroFit and just breathing in general as a performance mechanism is not just for better times on the track because better times on the track come from what you do on your bed, what you do off the track completely. So how do you recover? How do you sleep? How do you do these things? And breath, arguably, I'm, I'm, I, I know this to be a fact, but I'm letting you have an opportunity to speak to it, are arguably this breath training, not just AeroFit, but all breath conscious training helps you become a more well-rounded human being, not just an athlete, right? So I've, you've experienced some of this, Victor, I believe, you know, in terms of, you know, the rest of your world, not just the snoring thing, right, from strengthening your throat muscles and stopping the snoring reaction, but there's a lot of ancillary benefits that when people look at AeroFit, they think, oh, that's just a high-performance athlete mechanism. It's not going to help. Well, I'm not going to use it because I'm not an Olympian. Um, I would argue this helps everybody, not just Olympic level athletes at the end. Of I would, the day. I would argue it's the opposite. Even, uh, that like the, I would always say I've optimized a lot of things. So if you come in as a non-trained athlete, it would make a much larger difference in your life. Um, fair. Okay. Yeah. So I definitely, uh, I, I agree on that, that, um, that you would have, like you could get relatively even more out of it if you are not a trained athlete um and yeah it's there's a lot of ways to benefit like i said the snoring um but you also some of the specific um like sessions on the AeroFit. there's a lot of it that is based on mindfulness that are based on relaxation that are just beneficial to anybody i mean during daytime uh just to get rid of some some stress um I, yeah I always, well, you know, because you, you make my training program, I have a lot of <laughs> relaxation uh, sessions right before bedtime. And mm -hmm. that cost me to, even on days where I don't have it, I still do some conscious breathing um, just before going to bed. Because then I can, with almost 100% certainty, say that no matter how hard the, the day was, even if I had to take afternoon caffeine for a late training session or whatever, right, I right. can still, within five minutes, like find my calm and, and disappear into a dream. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so now let me, let me, let me branch over to some little other area that's kind of related here. So a while ago, you said, you know, mentioned five hours of training a day, right? And you know, that's and whatever you do during those five hours, let's, let the audience be clear that there's never five hours of AeroFit training, right? So please, <laughs> no, I'm not going to say how long you train with your AeroFit, right? But, but, Typically, because I wrote your protocols, I know what they are. Like typically, right, you're only using the AeroFit 12, 14 minutes max, I think, was one of the areas in my stretch, like a stretch day, if you will. So, um, you know, you're not using AeroFit for a half hour a day, for an hour a day. It's, it's not a no pain, no gain type of device where go, Joe, you know, go, Victor, go, keep going, push harder. It's really about relaxing and it doesn't take a lot of time to get value out of it and you you everything's about time for value at your level right do you do, you know if i asked you to do an hour of this a day to get the same benefit eh, you know i don't know if i have that much time but yeah it's yeah. only 12 minutes a day and the same goes for so, hobby hobby athletes like if you only have a very limited time of the day uh like i say i could and during the summertime i could bike five hours in the morning and then skate a marathon in the afternoon that's a whole lot of hours and Oof. very few people have that much, I wouldn't call it spare, but spare time, I guess. A uh, few people would have that <laughs> uh, to their availability. But the AeroFit is only 10 at the most, like you said, 15 minutes per day. Uh, mm -hmm. That is very little time for how much value and how much like, progress you can get out of it. Um, yeah. And that would be, if, if I had to cut my training down, I would definitely not touch the AeroFit part of it because it takes a little, and also it's so easy to like, you don't, you don't have to get dressed in any specific way. You don't have to warm up before using the AeroFit. Uh, it's, right. It's fairly simple. Yeah. And, and, and uh, as an asterisk here, that was not a paid statement. Victor said that on his own. <laughs> so, so if, I was, if I was to do that, I would say that's the one question I get the most often on social media is like, is it really worth that money? And if, for how little money that is compared to everything else that you spent when doing sports, 
uh, compared to the price of your bicycle or even the price of your running shoes, how much faster that'll make you compared to in increasing your your lung capacity, your lungs, your lung strength, and and the well-being aspect of it. I think it's a uh, it's pretty fair. Yeah, no, that's cool. And, th and thanks for saying that, because I get that question all the time. And the way I explain it to most people now is, you know, the, the, the sessions and the modules that are in the app itself, they were designed very thoughtfully by, you know, thought leaders and academics and people with, you know, a lot of, you know, commas and letters after their names, right, who, who kind of know what they're talking about. So um, I, I like to be fair and objective, you know, adding resistance to breathing it will will help you build muscle in your in your uh, respiratory musculature. So I, we always joke, you know, I could breathe through a straw and create resistance. There, there's no doubt about that. Um, but the, there's a method to the patterns of breathing and the styles and the, the, the expressions of patterns in the breathing inside the app that I find really cool because the way they were designed is based on the science of why your body reacts to how breath enters and exits your body. So, and there's a myriad of patterns that you could utilize to beneficial outcomes. And so there is a prescriptive protocol, if you will, a way to think about which one do I use today and for what reason. It's not just a simple breathe as hard as you can and in and out and I'm all set and I don't have to think about it anymore. Um, some people will be happy with that, but the more nuanced people, when they get to know their nervous system and they become more aware, I think they start to feel how those different patterns express themselves in their nervous system and in their psyche. And it starts to make deeper sense. It's, I, I don't dare call it an enlightening process. I don't want to get into religion, but, uh, but I, I do believe that there's some awareness that comes out of engaging with the AeroFit that you start to feel and think about how you express yourself as a breathing animal differently once you get to feel those different patterns. So I personally think that's important because I do this every day, that's my job. You know, the general public might not feel that right away, but I mean, if we if we tie it with you, Victor, quickly to a performance enhancement perspective, right? I saw your post the other day uh, about the number that you put up. <laughs> would you would you can you share? You know, when you started using Aerofit, you were at a certain volume capacity. So if we could talk right into brass tacks, and just the other day you posted a, a liter capacity that I was even surprised to see because it's pretty phenomenal. Um, can you share, you know, and you already had a pretty elevated leader capacity before you got the AeroFit, so it's not like you were starting at the bottom of the barrel, but w what's been, the, what's been the progress so far over time? Like, where did you start and where are you now uh, it's, from it's a been, VLC been, perspective? Uh, yeah, I would say it's been impressive. Uh, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, because I do also regret not knowing about it beforehand, because I spent... <laughs> 20 years. I told you that would happen. <laughs> yeah, <that's> <laughs> but it's still, uh, still hurts to know that I spent 20 years getting to almost eight liters, seven and a half liters. And then I spent less than half a year to getting that to 11, almost 12 liters. Uh, and the last test I had was 11.7. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, that's, if you look at it from, from where I came from and where I am now, that's that's huge. Um, and that's yeah. an untrained athlete, which is wild. Um, and yeah, it's it's incredible. So so let me I, for the people who don't know for the people who don't know what that number actually represents, um, some of the highest recorded you know vital lung capacity volumes in the, in the world. The, ro rowers rowers are notoriously really high VLC and VO two max people. Right, they're some of the highest, and and cyclists and, and speed skaters are among the highest as well. But I think in the record book world, right, the rowers uh, kind of usually win because they're usually those guys. I, I'm going to go imperial, not metric here, but you know, rowers in the Olympics are are a lot taller than you and I, Victor. They're massive architecture bodies, right? They're huge uh, uh, things, so they simply have larger architecture in their house to pull more air in. So in that world, I expect to see some of those numbers that you're putting up for, for people our size, and you're a little, a little taller than me, but you're not a giant, right? To, to, to put up that number, um, I would argue you are expressing all of the flexibility you have available to you to get to that number. Like there's nothing hidden anymore. And I don't expect you to continue to, you know, eventually we're a, we're a, 
our balloon is in a cage, right? Eventually, you're not going to be able to expand that balloon much more at, at the end of the day. So I would argue, theoretically, you're, you're, you're pretty close to the top, if not at the top of your capacity. So that's an incredible climb. And to your point, I always tell people not to get superstitious about this, not to hate your past because you wish you had this before. Be happy in the moment that you, that you have it now. Um, but also, I think here's something that's really important, and you're going to start to experience this. And uh, I won't talk about your personal disposition. That's up to you. As an athlete, I became superstitious with things sometimes. I know a lot of athletes who are superstitious about things or overthink things. With me, some of my friends who are cyclists in the, in the tours, they've reached their apex, if you will, of their vital lung capacity, their max. And now on a day-to-day -day basis, they go, they're at the top going up and down, right? So one day they'll have you know, 9.2, the next day they'll have 8.8, .8, and I'll get a text on WhatsApp going, yeah, Sean, what am I doing wrong? And I'm like, you're doing nothing wrong. You know, it, 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 what did you eat? How did you sleep? What did you drink? You know, all these other things come into play. So I want everybody to know, and I want you to know, Victor, as well, right? That once you get to the top and you start bouncing up and down, don't pay attention to the minor dips, right? Don't, don't go, oh, I'm going to have a bad day because yesterday I had a higher VLC score than today. That's simply not the case. Um, and I want everybody to be aware of that because people are hard on themselves. And every, you know, people who want to achieve goals, they always want to go up and to the right. You know, yeah, eventually, you, <laughs> right? It becomes very competitive with yourself. So in the, in, the, in the concept of trying to relax to breathe more so you could attain more energy, don't add stress to this type of training. Let it, let it benefit you in its own way and don't put hyper performance because once you do that, it becomes restrictive to your breathing mechanism. Once you put stress around your breath, you, you close it down. So it's this really wonderful dichotomy, this paradigm where you have to work towards maximum performance and be super relaxed at maximum performance so you don't shrink it once you're at that stage. So statement to everybody who uses AeroFit, once you get to your max performance, just smile and be happy that you've reached that level, right? And, and kind of start looking at other areas and start focusing on your sleep and all these other areas and what you could do to benefit those things. So, um, uh, no, that's I'm, also, I'm super I, stoked you're explaining, you're sharing. I also try and so look cool. at it more, uh, I generally do the, the testing every second day. Um, and also cause we spoke of it or I spoke about it. I try and not look into every single test, but more the trend, um, mm -hmm. which I still think can be pretty interesting to look at, not from the whole, like how, for how long can I keep improving? but more to, to see if there is like any like severe drops in it. Um, a good example would be, I did an altitude camp and yeah, it, it dropped by quite a lot. Um, all, I think I was down at eight and a half for a while. Okay. Uh, which also puts everything into perspective that like, especially if we talk, if it's worth it, that the AeroFit improved my lung capacity way more than the effect of an altitude camp. So that was pretty cool. Um, but that's very cool. Yeah. Then I used it also to like, to just track where I was heading, uh, to see when am I ready to train at a 100%, uh, load again, and just to monitor that. And, uh, and those, that those that smart, especially with the, like the device and, the, um, the software that it adapts to how you're feeling on the day, uh, which I think goes yeah. for a lot of athletes that they easily become too competitive. And like you just said, you should not, cause then you end up being tense and then you kind of lose out in the whole point. Um, so knowing that every day, if you do the test, the training program and the resistance will be kind of customized to how, how you perform in the given day. I think that's pretty cool. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think you made a really awesome. brilliant point before, right? If, if things are, if things are optimal, the best thing to do is let them be and not pay attention to them. Right. And, and so, yeah, I, I, I 100% agree with you that no matter who uses an AeroFit device or thinks about their breathing, once you feel good about your breathing, let it go. Enjoy it, it, Simply enjoy the fact that it's operating at its best and stop paying attention to it. It's, it's like the yoga philosophy, right? It's like you practice all this yoga all the time so you don't pay attention to your body. That's the whole purpose, right? If you stop having to be aware and we well, won't get into ego and all that other stuff, but if you just as an athlete, Stop paying attention to what your body's doing and let it do its most efficient movement cycles because you're out of the way. Your mind isn't 
restricting or holding or putting parameters on your movement, I believe that's when sport becomes art. That's just me. I think, you know, I see someone skate like you. I watch Joey skate like I was watching Joey the other day. And I see art at that level because there's a, a mechanism of release that you simply have been, you've trained your mechanics long enough that they could happen if you get out of the way. And beautiful things happen yeah, when you yeah. get out of the way. Got to make it kind of thing, easy right? and natural. Same goes it's, for Yeah, uh, and, all, for and all of a sudden, yeah. all of a sudden, yeah, all of a sudden you're in that flow state and you're going faster by not, by feeling like you're not working as hard, right? And that's the magical space that all athletes look to attain is getting into that flow, if you will. And I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, I, I brought up flow purposely because I wanted to get your opinion and your thoughts on that, right? As, as a speed skater, you're a biomechanical repeater, right? You're doing the same thing over and over and over and over, yeah, just like cycling. Pretty big on the you know, repeating and, stuff. Right, right. So, so getting into that mindset, at some point, I would argue you've been in a state of flow during races and during training before. Um, has your breathing and your, 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 your transformational work that you've been doing with your breathing in general, have you seen it affect your ability to get into that flow state or that mental state where you put yourself at ease and still perform at the highest outputs? Like, is that, do you feel mental state changes, I guess, at the end of the yeah. day? Uh, yeah. I, one thing I still need to work on is finding that if I lose it. But when I enter an interval or enter a session or a sprint even, if then I always dial in my breathing as I enter it. I'm aware of it. I can, like, feel it. And then it kind of becomes a nice little rhythm thing. Um, but if I lose it underway, I still need to work on catching it again. Like, returning okay. to the the comfortable breathing state. Um, yeah. But now it's the thing that I'm conscious of when I start an interval and like getting into position, getting my breathing set, and then I just nail it from there. So it's much easier for me to get into that, if we call it the zone. Um, the, yeah. Um, yeah. Where it's like you got this rhythm in your head of your steps and everything and, and it feels very just natural, like floating a little. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, especially in a mass start, there's a lot of stuff you gotta. You can't predict anything in a mass start. Um, no, it's chaos. It's chaos navigation. Yeah, right? exactly. I mean... <laughs> and I think that's one of the things where, even though my lung capacity is should be close to its max, um, there's still a lot of this breathing when using it practically that I can still improve on. And uh, yeah, and also just yeah. the same way I I think I haven't gotten faster on skates the last three years. Like my max speed hasn't improved a a bit. Maybe even got worse. Uh, I don't care so much because I don't do sprints. But yeah. my sub max, so which is my race pace when skating a mass start or a five k, became it became easier for me to be there. And that's also oh, where cool. I sense things are going with the breathing. Like I might not increase my lung capacity but it'll get easier for me to, to use all of it and take less energy yeah. and then hopefully more energy left for, for the fun stuff. Yeah, that, that is awesome. I love to hear that. It's such a great thing that's happening. Um, I, 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 I do want to, I, I want to ask one little bit about your rate, you know, when, when Victor's in a race, right? Here's, here's, the, here's the ultimate mindset, at least from, I'm being selfish asking this question because I just want to know. Right. I, I know enough about myself that what, what, when I was in a race, I would know what distract would distract me. So as a cyclist, I'd sit there paying attention to my RPMs, paying attention to my wattage, paying attention to those things. When you're on a long track race and you're racing against a clock or, you know, there's another skater and one, you know, two, two guys on the ice. What is most tempting to distract you and what, do, what are you cycling through in your mind? Are you are you? Is there a metric that you're thinking about? Do you allow yourself to just let go because you know enough about your art that you feel your way around the ice? Like what's cycling through your mind? If you don't mind me asking, Victor, when you're going, what's the challenges to keep that relaxation going? What sneaks in and tries to distract you? Uh, I think I would say it's when I, I realize that I got to go fast here. All the good okay. races I've had, are races where I don't, I mean, it's not like I go into the races without a serious mindset, but it's just, I don't focus too much on like, oh, I got to get the right splits. I got to skate fast. Um, I know if I can make the first, say 5k, 12 and a half laps, if I can make the first seven and a half laps 
without thinking about the first seven and a half laps. Just, oh, this is nice. I skate well. I try and put my skates where I like them to be. I look up, see the lap times. Don't worry too much about it. Maybe it's fast, maybe it's slow. Um, but where I feel very loose, then I know that when it gets to the hard part, the last five laps, I have the energy and then I can like start to push through there. Um, sure. So the one thing that could get me out of the zone is like, would be worrying about skating fast and not skating well. Because generally gotcha. good skating leads to fast skating. And right, then of course. Be before race, I think that's the best advice I ever had. My, I had a phone call with my childhood coach less than an hour before the, the final at the last Olympics where he told okay. me like, the most important thing here is to have fun. <laughs> and then right. like I thought that was the, the dumbest piece of advice you could give and then he explained sure, to me like sure. you've been skating since you were six like you trained every single day twice a day for 20 years and it's not like you're gonna forget how to skate like that's already I mean if you haven't learned how to skate yet you're yeah. it's not gonna be today um right. so so <laughs> if you have fun then you stay relaxed and I went out there and I, I've seen the video after and I go out there and smile, say hi to the camera and like wave at some Chinese or uh, Korean people. And I'm like, I, yeah, yeah. I don't, when I look at it, it doesn't look like I'm even serious about it. Um, but I mean, that just made me calm. I didn't focus about, oh yeah, I got to win the Olympics. I got to win the Olympics. I just lined up for it and like, oh, it's going to be fun skating. And then yeah, yeah. obviously it's not like, oh, I forgot to give my 100 because I was having too much fun there. It's not going to be like that. Um, cause sure. then when it starts hurting, then, then you have that energy to push through cause you haven't been so tense. You haven't been overly nervous about things. And even though it sounds like, oh, it's just there to compete. If you go to the line and if you skate the race, having fun, you, you kind of already like it's already a success from the beginning. So that made me right. stop being so nervous about hitting the right lap times or going at the right pace from the beginning. Yeah. So I think, yeah. I know it's great, right? It's chilling. It, the, 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 it's the simple elegance of, of, of advice, right? The, the best advice is always the, it's the shortest and the simplest, right? At the end of the day. And it's just our job to accept that and not fight it. Uh, at the end of the day. So I love, I love to hear that. It is about having fun at the highest competition. It should still be enjoyable because your, your, your coach is brilliant. Uh, you know, um, you'd have to work hard to mess up your skating at this stage, right? It's, it's so ingrained in you. And, and again, I, I think that speaks to mindset. And I think this is why I love breathing in general, because, you know, breath work helps you control those distractions and not get in your own way. Right. So you could still smile at the hardest of things and actually be aware that you should be even at your most painful state when your legs are screaming at you and you're screaming, shut up legs in your mind. You should be smiling then, too. Right. Because that, that you chose to do this to yourself. So that should make you happy as well. All <laughs> right. So yeah, sure. when the pain kicks in, when the pain kicks in, all athletes should be saying, thank you for letting me even experience this pain instead of getting mad at it or worrying about it. Cause that's what you chose to do. So you might as well greet it with a smile and, and say, yeah, yeah this, work with this it. rocks, yeah. right? Yeah, let's go. Um, so I, that's my mindset about all this stuff. It's like when the pain kicks in, I love that. Cause that's what you've been working for, right? This whole time. So your inner smile has to come out to go past that. So, and I think that's important. So, and that's, a, that's a free diving mechanism too. When, when you're underwater holding your breath and you're getting to four five, six, seven, some people, 15 minutes, Right. You're, you're going to go through convulsions and diaphragmatic spasms and all these other things. And you have to smile at those things and kind of like say, yeah, welcome. Welcome to the game. Um, thanks for joining. I expected you and not, and not try to kick that feeling away, because when you when you meet those feelings with with intolerance, you're going to cycle down. You're not going to be able to maintain. So I, I want to just say that in front of everybody in the it audience is, here. Right. It is a terrible meet, meet habit your pain we, with pleasure. Yeah, it's a terrible habit that we all have that when like when you need to when something hurts you want to fight that or you like it's not the the most natural reaction to just relax in it like you do the opposite it's like yeah. 
every test I've done for my lung capacity, when I try and like really perform, I mess it up. Like that's where I have my work. Right, of course. <laughs> and because you want to be as relaxed as possible, if you want to expand your lungs fully, if you want to skate smoothly and and without being too mechanical, too restricted, you got to chill in it. And uh, yeah. yeah, I think I also, I often have that. I have my coach yelling at me on the stretch where he stands. He yells at me the last two laps of almost every face he or every race he he yells at me relax your face because I have this like <laughs> terrible illogical reaction of like oh, just tensing my face yeah, up sure. which makes no sense because yeah. that's why would you use energy <laughs> in your face when you're already too tired to skate? Um, I love it. I love it. And it's kind of the same with the with the lungs. Like tell them to <laughs> chill. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. I always hear, I don't know if you know uh, Jens Voigt. He was a cyclist. He has his great shirt that says Shut Up Legs. Shut up I don't know if you have his. Yeah, yeah, I love that shirt. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Um, uh, listen, I, I want to be I want to be mindful. I'm looking at the clock here, Victor. Time is going by very That's fast <laughs> for you and I here. Uh, it's flown by. Um, I think initially we said, what, a half hour? Now it's, we're going to go well past an hour pretty quickly. Um, I don't, I don't want to let you off the hook yet because I do want to ask you a couple quick more questions if you don't mind. Um, two, two, right? And I don't want to go into COVID, but you're you're an athlete training with COVID around the world right now, and you're prepping for the Winter Olympics that are coming up. A once in a lifetime, you know, twice in a lifetime opportunity for you. Um, and so, um, and you are of a certain age. This potentially could be your last Olympics. I don't know. Um, I don't want to put that out there if you are thinking you might go beyond this Olympics. But you're training in a unique world right now. Um, people are isolated. Um, it's what's going to happen at the Olympics of looking at the summer Olympics and looking how that was, there was nobody in the audience. There was, you know, it's a different environment. I'm not going to suggest it affects you once you get on the ice. What's, what's been different for you in planning for the winter Olympics coming up and has it affected your training psychologically? Has it affected your training physically at all? I would argue maybe more psychologically than physically, but I don't know. I'm just curious as to how you're dealing with the state of the union right now in the world with, with COVID going around? Um, I wouldn't say my preparation for the Olympics, uh, it hasn't been that much of a disturbance. But in the beginning, when things were super uncertain, uh, it did bother me a lot. Because hmm. I really don't mind the whole um, like being focused on one single goal that lies far ahead. Um, hmm. And I don't mind the whole... like being isolated or skating without um, an audience. Obviously, it's nice when people cheer and all. Um, sure. But what, really, what I really struggled with was in the beginning when things were super uncertain. Like, we didn't know, is there going to be a World Cup next month or is it going to be in three months? And I really like to plan my training ahead of time. I feel very comfortable when I know what's going to happen in half a year already. Um, yeah. And... This was very like, oh, there's no World Cup in a week, so we'll have to change everything. <laughs> I was tapering down for this one race. I was like excited about it, and I set myself yep. up for it. So I already planned in the beginning of last season when they canceled our first World Cups and we weren't sure about anything. Then I already decided that my next goal is going to be the 2022 Olympic Games. So that kind of took everything out of the way. So I've just been focused on my training and haven't stressed too much about it. Yeah, that, no, that's cool. I'm, I'm glad it, it's nice. To, well, I mean, fingers crossed for everybody that everything keeps hopefully gets a positive direction and we have full support from the committees and everybody else who's putting this organizational body together because it's a lot of work to get all these athletes in one place and compete together. So um, I could only express to you that I, I, I know a lot about how much effort you've put in throughout your whole life and how hard you work at this. So I pray that all things go well. Um, so you could have a good showing there. Um, and um, I, I mean, I could probably talk to you for 10 more hours, to be fair, Victor, about a lot of stuff, but I, but I have to be kind to our audience too, and not torture them by making this last five hours, right? But uh, um, I mean, you know, with the, with the Olympics coming up and everything else coming up, you know, what, what else is in your future, you know, past, past the Olympic, what, where does your career go next? You know, what, what, what's beyond the Olympics, if you will, for, for Victor Thorpe, you know, in speed skating or, or in life in general? I think I, I want to skate as long as I'm good at it, as long as it's fun. And that 
generally yeah. goes well with how good I, I perform. Um, but <laughs> right. after that, I, I for sure, I want to stay in like the sports health environment. Um, so whether that means coaching or working as a dietitian, I, I can't tell yet. Um, I do really enjoy like teaching people how to skate because that's cool. It often takes, I maybe mean, you should probably know from the breathing things that you know, um, for other people that never heard of it before, you can give very simple advice and it makes a world of a difference. And, and that I like going back to that where right now I really change tiny, tiny things. I work in it for half a mm -hmm. year and it makes me one second better where I enjoy like, helping <laughs> people out. Like, Oh, how about you just switch to these wheels and they go twice as fast. It's right. That's um, cool. So maybe that's where I'll be heading. Yeah, that's all. I mean, well, I mean, for the amount of time you've put into this, you are officially more than an expert at this stage of your life. And if you don't share that, it would almost be a crime in a lot of ways. So even if you don't do it professionally, I'm sure it's going to be a part of your life. Uh, you know, it's something that's ingrained in you. And and quite honestly, um, you and I aren't physically near each other all the time. But um, believe it or not, I'm, I'm telling the truth. Whenever I see you post a video of you skating, I probably watch it eight or nine times. I don't watch it once uh, because I am a biomechanically interested person. So I watch how your legs move. I watch how your wheels land. I watch all those things because I'm hyper interested in your efficiencies. So um, thank you for even sharing your journey along the way with everybody because I think it's really cool. And by the way, you're just really good at this social media thing. You're, the videos you put up are just really well put together. I love watching them. I, I share them with that. my friends and family. So I think it's really cool. Um, and you know, and I live in Florida, it, which is not the epicenter of speed skating. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going around in the hot weather in the middle of the summer sharing with people speed skating training concepts. So I think it's just a really fun thing to do. Um, I, I personally can't wait to the Winter Olympics to, to watch you. Um, in a perfect world, I'd be there cheering you on. Um, so I, I wish I could do that. So, but it, anyway, the Aerofit team, uh, the, the people who work in our office, our community, we all thank you for hanging around with us and, and taking this risk, if you will, of trying to train your breath and, and use Aerofit and share openly and transparently with everybody. So I just want to thank you for myself personally, um, Victor, I think what you're doing is incredible. And um, I think you're not just an incredible athlete. I think you're a really amazing human being. So stick, keep at it. And thanks nice for sharing work. your time with that us. That goes, goes yeah, both yeah. ways. I'm just happy to be part of it as well. Yeah, no, it's super cool. So um, listen, I'll, I'll wrap it up here, everybody. Um, Victor, again, thank you uh, again from the bottom of our hearts for taking the time to come into the office and share a little time with us today. And we will follow your journey is any last any last things you want to make the audience aware of uh that's coming up for you or you know otherwise we could just sign off i guess but i'll give you your yeah, no. i'll give you the last word no just uh stay tuned world cups are uh, starting in three months so if you're interested okay, you cool. can you can follow the world cups on isu the, the youtube channel or um, cool. if you're lucky to be dutch on tv <laughs> cool cool and i would i guess i would be a bad youtube guy if i didn't say you know we'll put victor's social media tags at the bottom of this video once it's produced um so please follow follow victor um, but victor you should verbalize your so where can people follow you on social media so people could keep an eye on you as your journey continues they can follow me on the gram on instagram thor victor yeah and uh on youtube i have a youtube channel where i uh yeah I teach the World Wide Web how to uh, to do cool stuff on skates, mainly just fast yeah, stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, I try and look yeah, at what I do. very fast stuff, <laughs> very fast stuff actually. Uh, yeah, so please follow Victor, guys. He, he's been on a brilliant journey, and um, the way Victor looks at life and sport is something that should be modeled. Uh, so again, Victor, really cool, ha really great having you here, um, and we'll we'll talk again soon. Thanks.